So after reading A Spear Cuts Through Water, I just have one question for Simon Jimenez. What's up, folks? This is your boy, Darko. Welcome to another edition of Kindles and Kicks. Okay, so today I'm talking about A Spear Cuts Through Water by Mr. Simon Jimenez. Simon, brother, I don't know if you'll ever, ever in your life watch this video, but on the off chance you do, maybe my girl Evie has sent it to you. But I just got one question for you. Where do you get off writing something this damn good? This doesn't make any sense, people. I have not read anything like this ever. So let me, let me tell you a few reasons why. First, I was hooked immediately. The book starts off in second person, and I know this is a turnoff for many people, sometimes even myself, but the you in this story was so me. And the reason is the you person is chilling with his Lola or his grandmother, and she's recounting these beautiful and mythic tales of the history of their family and their ancestors from a different time in a different place. And I can relate to this so deeply because I remember being little and my grandmother telling, telling me stories of my family from a different time in a different place. Although unlike this Lola, she didn't smoke any cigarettes. But I had babysitters who did. Yeah, see, in the 80s and 90s, where I grew up, we didn't have childcare facilities. We had babysitters, and they were all older women, retired, who loved children and looking for some extra cash. And so parents would leave us with them, and they all smoked cigarettes. And while smoking those cigarettes, just like the Lola in this book, they would tell me stories of their ancestors and their families and their journeys. And I would sit there bored and, and sigh and annoyance and irritation. But as I've grown older, I now appreciate those stories. Because I, I finally understood that my ancestors, my ancestors and my elders didn't have money, property, jewelry to leave behind for their descendants. So they left these stories because this is what's left of their legacy. And it's up to people like me who heard and listened to these stories to carry them on to other generations. Like the you in this story does at times with his younger siblings. And so while your Lola are telling you these stories in the book, it goes from second person to third person. Because eventually you land in this weird theater that I won't go into detail about because you need to read the book. And you're watching a live play with actors who are performing the tales that your Lola has told you in your lifetime. And now you're watching these events unfold live right in front of you via actors. Crazy enough, I could relate to this part because eventually the town where I grew up it became a part of an arts district. And in that arts district was built a theater. And in that theater, they did plays. And one of those plays depicted the life of some of my family. So I sat there and watched a performer's and a playwright's interpretation of the history of my family, and I can't even explain how that felt. It literally brought tears to my eyes to watch that and see others watching and enjoying it themselves. As you watch these actors perform your Lola's narratives, 
The story goes deeper, and now you are in the shoes of the characters this story is about, the real life characters, two of which are named June and Kima. And both of them are very, very well written and well developed. Kima is on his own mission to fulfill the dying wish of someone he greatly admires. June is on a mission to save his goddess grandmother, who he helped escape from his crazy god grandfather. And now they are fleeing his father and her son, whose name the First Terror. Yes, there are three main antagonists in here named the first, second, and third terror. So as they journey through towns and villages and markets, the POV switch from first to second to third person randomly. It's insane. Like this is, this is to me what you would call acid fantasy because it is a trip. Most of the first person POVs are people in the crowd who are witnessing the acts of the two main characters and their antagonists. And as you go on your journey, you encounter all kind of whimsical and magical and godlike creatures like anthropomorphized monkeys and birds and peacocks and turtles. Turtles are a big thing in this book, but hey, who doesn't love turtles? There's another underlying theme here. There's a budding romance between the two protagonists and it's so beautifully and subtly done that I just found it endearing. And it was so refreshing to see two gay men represented well in a fantasy novel. Bravo, Mr. Jimenez. Bravo. Now, there are plenty of battle and fight scenes that will please the most bloodthirsty reader. But there's also battles for redemption and forgiveness and battles for, for self-confidence and self-esteem, which to me are even more important and resonate even deeper than the other battles. Also, Simon Jimenez has a way of writing horrific, horrific scenes that make them absolutely gorgeous. Like he makes cannibalism beautiful. And you may think I'm crazy when I say that, but yes, there are some brutal and violent instances of cannibalism, but then there are ones of love and sacrifice. It's very similar to those who are familiar or practice Christianity, the consumption of the blood and body of Jesus Christ. On the surface, yes, it sounds icky, but looking deeper, it's beautiful. It's someone asking you to consume all of them, mind, body, soul, and spirit. And Simon Jimenez depicts this so, so well. Again, bravo, Mr. Jimenez, bravo. Now, I can't really compare this book to anything I've ever read. If I could compare Simon Jimenez as a writer, I do get some Neil Gaiman vibes from him, particularly the way he handles gods or godlike figures in this book. And also Susanna Clark with the ethereal and metaphorical and poetic way he writes. Gorgeous, beautiful, amazing. If I had one critique, there is a particular derogatory term used in this book pretty liberally that could trigger persons with disabilities. I'm not going to repeat the word. Anyone who, who's read this book knows the word I'm referring to. And anyone using context clues may even hazard a guess. One character, Kima, is a one-armed mercenary. So yes, in some ways, he's disabled, but in some ways, it makes him even fiercer. So if you're looking for a unique experience and something 
unlike anything out there right now, I would recommend this book. Even if you don't like it, I guarantee you, you will not regret reading it. At the very least, it will teach you that a narrative structure, tropes, rules can be broken completely and still make a highly compelling, evocative, and entertaining story. Again, bravo, Mr. Jimenez. Bravo. I want to thank Dan from Black and Blue Collar Reader and Evie from She Was Only Evie. The two of them have lauded the qualities of this book incessantly, and I can't say I blame them because it is a remarkable piece of fiction, of art, of literature. And I suggest anyone watching this video to pick it up and read it as soon as possible. All right, folks, this is your boy Darko, Kindles and Kicks. Like, comment, subscribe. I'll see you next time. Peace. Hello? This is Kayla.